There are over 35,000 museums within the United States, welcoming over 850 million visitors each year. Did you ever wonder what goes on behind the scenes in museums, creating the displays and exhibits we all enjoy? Join us as we explore museums and their exhibits from the inside out. Hi, I'm Leslie Mueller. Welcome to Museum Access, the show that takes you to America's top museums to talk to the experts. Then we go behind the scenes to learn even more. Believe it or not, we're in the middle of Los Angeles at an urban Ice Age excavation site, the La Brea Tar Pits. This museum houses millions of fossils that were discovered right here. These plants, insects, and animals were trapped in sticky asphalt over 50,000 years ago. From mammoth tusks to mouse toes, fossils are excavated, cleaned, and sorted for research and display every day. It's the only active Ice Age excavation site in an urban location in the world. Over 3.5 million fossils have been removed from the tar pits to date, and they're still digging. Today we'll learn about the importance of this particular site and learn more about a Colombian mammoth named Zed. Then we'll head to Project 23 for a behind the scenes look at the amazing work that's being done thanks to a discovery during the construction of a new underground garage. And we'll take a behind the scenes look at the fossil labs. So are you ready to take a scientific journey that began during the Ice Age? Let's go. So Emily, tell me about this museum. It's unbelievable. I've never been to one like this. How did this all start? Well, there aren't very many places like this. I so know. the La Brea Tar Pits is actually one of the most important paleontological sites in the whole world. Paleontological? <laughs> paleontological, so a site with fossils. So any fossils, um, lots of things can be fossils, right? Plants can be fossils, insects can be fossils, shells can be fossils. Um, here we find all of those things, and we also find the fossils of, most famously, the really big mammals that used to live here during the Ice Age. So saber-toothed cats and giant ground sloths and mammoths and mastodons and dire wolves all used to live right here in LA and we know that because we find their bones right here in the asphalt seeps in our park. So let's talk about the beginning of the, the land itself. So the asphalt seeps that we find here have actually been known about for thousands of years. We know that the indigenous tribes in California used to use the asphalt for waterproofing of uh, vessels and boats and, and pots and baskets and things like that. Um, but fossils were first discovered here in the late 1800s. Um, people had found large bones here before, but they'd always thought that it was, you know, bones of cattle that were here on the ranch or something like that until uh, a scientist who was traveling through saw a bone that turned out to be the saber tooth of a saber tooth cat. Whoa. And that was when they really recognized that the history of this site went much, much deeper and had a lot to tell science. So the city was kind of built around it fast fast forward because they felt that it was usable ground still? Well, so Los Angeles, the city developed here for a number of reasons, but one of those reasons is oil, which is of course the reason that we have uh, this site is because of the oil that's underground that seeps up in certain places and creates these very sticky pools that have trapped the plants and animals over the last 50,000 years. So is that what a tar pit would be? So yeah, so when we say tar pits, that's sort of a colloquial term. Um, um, they're more properly called asphalt seeps, so the okay. liquid that's si uh, seeping up, basically. The liquid yeah. that's seeping up here is, is asphalt, which is a very low-grade crude oil. And that comes from this big oil field that's underground. It's about a thousand feet oh below God. our feet. And because there's a lot of earthquakes here in the Los Angeles area, oh. sometimes these areas of structural weakness form in the earth and these cracks open up and that oil is able to make its way up to the surface. And when it does, it forms these um, really relatively shallow pools of, of asphalt. Hmm. And that asphalt is, 
it does two things. So first of all, it's extremely sticky, and so it's trapped, you know, thousands upon thousands of organisms, sure. plants, animals, big things, small things here over the years. But also, asphalt has the quality of being able to preserve a lot of okay. different types of fossils. So it's very, very unusual to find fossils of plants and bones in the same paleontological site because mm. the types of sediments that preserve one tend to dissolve the other, but asphalt preserves them both. It's also sort of unusual to find big fossils and small fossils together just because the way that those deposits get made is mm -hmm. very different, mm -hmm. but the asphalt seeps uh, collect everything. And so what that means is that what we have here is one of the best places anywhere in the world to look at an entire ecosystem in the past. Well, I noticed some cones outside, and it would say, I think it said like goop or something on it. Are those actually the seeps? I mean, they're still coming up. They're still coming up. That's so yeah, every day, you know, people walk through the park, and sometimes a new seep has opened up uh, in the lawn or in our parking lot or on the sidewalk across <laughs> the street. And so when we see one, we put a, a cone there so people know not to step there because once you get it on your, you know, fancy shoes, it's never oh, going to yeah. come off. I so. know. Well, tell me about some of the exhibits that we're seeing here because we're talking about this sticky tar and I did see a couple exhibits that how are you showing people what what that's like yeah so we have you know one of our most popular exhibits is actually this very <laughs> simple interactive where you can pull up on a lever basically and feel yeah. just how sticky Try that to pull up, is <laughs> and yeah, just how hard it would yeah. be to get out of it because we don't want people of course like actually going into the asphalt seeps and getting stuck because that's messy and you know hard to hard to rescue yeah. but um, that's a way where people can see both how sticky it is and the difference that uh, an animal with like small feet versus an animal with really big feet would have mm -hmm. felt because of course the bigger your feet are the more surface area that is stuck in yeah. that really sticky substance and it's just it's really hard to believe unless you do it I think. Well, and just seeing that, I, the, the kids loved it. And speaking of kids, I've seen a lot of kids running around. What kind of programs are there here? Are there outreach programs for school children? Or Yeah, we have school groups coming through all the time. Oh, we God. reach uh, 100,000 school kids a year, I think. I mean, just an incredible number of students. And in fact, a lot of grown-ups that I talk to in LA, when I say that I work at the Tar Pits, they remember coming here as kids. Oh, okay. um, so it's an incredibly compelling place for kids because, you know, what child doesn't love a saber tooth? cat attacking a giant ground sloth like that. Oh one, yeah, right? and the fact that it's like a diorama that moves. Absolutely. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah, but um, you know, it's it's a really interesting place for adults to come to because the science that we have here is so unique and so important for understanding what's going on in the world today and a lot of the environmental crises crises that grown-ups are concerned about as well. Things like, you know, climate change and uh, human impacts on ecosystems and extinction. These are all stories that are captured in the past at this site because the last 50 thousand years, which is the time period that our fossil record covers, mm -hmm. includes the last major episode of global warming as we're coming out of the last ice age. It includes the time when humans first arrived in the Americas and spread out and started interacting with ecosystems and likely hunting certain animals. And it includes the most important extinction event of the last 65 million years, which is when the about two-thirds of the large mammals in North America and many other continents all went extinct in a relatively short period of time. And that was during this time of overlapping climate change and okay. increasing human population, which is really similar to what we see happening today. Absolutely. So is there research that's actually going on here other than the fossil labs? I saw the fossil labs, but is there climate research going on too? Absolutely. So uh, we have a team of scientists. There are uh, researchers and postdocs and graduate students working here, as well as scientists from all over the world that come um, throughout the year to do studies on these fossils, again, because this is a record that you can't get pretty much anywhere else in the world. The ability to study uh, the sheer variety of mm -hmm. types of fossils and the sheer number of some fossils. You know, this has been a mecca for people studying, say, 
uh, small-scale evolutionary uh, sort of adaptation to climate change for a long time, especially in large carnivores, because we have, you know, somewhere in the so nature many. of 5,000 dire wolves oh and 2,500 saber-toothed cats, and you don't get numbers like that at, at yeah. other types of sites in these species. But I would think there would be a challenge with getting those numbers, since millions have, have come out. How do you record all of them? How do you be sure that you've got... Do you have archives? Do you, do you record them digitally? What do you do? Well, so all of, we've been excavating here off and on for over 100 years. Oh and God. so um, from the 100 year ago excavations, we have these huge ledger books and oh, yeah. where you know, people were just handwriting in. Oh and God. so we've uh, working with both our collections team and also a team of volunteers mm -hmm. that uh, God bless we the volunteers, absolutely, right? absolutely could not you know, get our work done without our amazing volunteers here that are going through now and digitizing, getting oh, all God. of this information that's in these hundred year old ledger books into uh, an online database where we can then easily search and say, oh, how many uh, left legs of uh, saber tooth cats do we have? And yeah. we can pull all of those oh, out my and God. figure it out. So. so I see this great fossil lab over my shoulder. What is that? So this is a working research lab that we have, and we actually work in there seven days a week. We have staff and volunteers that are cleaning the fossils that we've just brought out of the excavations. They're repairing them if they're broken, gluing pieces back together, and doing conservation work on them so we know that that fossil will be in good shape for scientists to study, not just tomorrow or next week, but 100 years from now. But it's not just bones and teeth. It, it's plants, right? And yeah, so it's, um, you know, you can see the, the big things that people are working on, but there's actually a whole section of the lab where we're looking at fossils through microscopes because we are going through the dirt that's been collected around those fossils of mm -hmm. saber-toothed cats and giant sloths, and hidden in that dirt are the bones and remains of everything from tiny lizards and birds all the way to the seeds of trees and wow. leaf fragments and uh, even little bits of insects. And wow. so it's just a really incredible record of what Los Angeles has looked like over the last 50,000 years yeah. that these seeps have been coming up in our park. And it's an incredibly important story because things like mammoths and saber-toothed cats mm -hmm. and dire wolves, um, as cool as they are, they had huge ranges. And these are, these are species that lived over much of North America and often even into Central and South America. Hmm. And so they don't tell us a whole lot about what Los Angeles looked like, mm -hmm. right? But certain species of bushes or insects or songbirds or lizards can actually tell us a lot about what the environment was like right here because these are species that have really narrow environmental requirements. And so, you know, if it's too hot or too cold or too wet or too dry, they're not going to live in a place. And so if we want to know exactly what Los Angeles looks like and how that changed, mm -hmm. uh, how the ecosystem and the communities changed in response to climate change over the last 50,000 year period of, uh, of in and out of ice ages, those are the, spe the specimens that we really have to be looking at. And so that's a big part of the work that we do in the fossil lab as well. Well, I saw something in the fossil lab and, and I've been hearing about Zed. Tell me a little bit about what, what was this discovery? So uh, we name a lot of our important discoveries. Uh, of Zed, course. Zed is a mammoth. Uh, okay. and he was found uh, during a part of a project, a salvage excavation project called Project 23, which was a series of incredible fossil deposits that were found when the art museum next door to us built a parking garage about 12 years ago. And Zed is a mammoth. And he is uh, the most complete mammoth we've found. Wow. And a very rare instance where we found most of the bones of a large animal that were mostly in the right position as they would have been in life. So that's that's got to be rare. Right? It's very yeah. rare. It's not rare necessarily at other paleontological mm -hmm. sites, but it's very rare here at the tar pits mm -hmm. because in the thousands of years that specimens are sitting in the asphalt, uh, they seem to get uh, sort of disarticulated mm -hmm. and even jumbled Shifting. up a bit. Yeah, yeah. and so yeah. you'll find you know, uh, individual bones of a lot of animals and maybe potentially 
multiple bones of the same animal, but they're not necessarily found close to one another. But Zed was found sort of beautifully laid out because he's actually an example of uh, an animal that died and was washed into a stream bed and buried before the asphalt came in. So he didn't step in an asphalt seep and get stuck. He actually died in more of a normal fossil sort of way, mm -hmm, got mm -hmm. buried, and then later asphalt came in and helped to preserve his skeleton. And so you can see two of his tusks on display yes, that are on that. display yeah. here. Um, we've been working on uh, preparing his skull also to come out on exhibit, and there are other bits of him around the museum exhibits. Well, I'm anxious to see this Project 23, and then I think we'll step into the a fossil lab Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, let's go take a look at Thanks, it. Thanks, Emily. Saber-toothed cats were as large as African lions, but more heavily built. They relied on stealth rather than speed to hunt and ambush bison, camels, and ground sloths. Scientists are still investigating how these felines use their most memorable feature, their four-inch fangs. These sabers may have been used for stabbing and slashing or biting open the soft underbelly of their prey. The American Mastodon became extinct about 10,000 years ago. They look similar to mammoths, but were separated by 25 million years of evolution, and they show key differences, especially in their teeth. While mammoths had relatively flat teeth, which were great for grinding grass, their main food source, the much smaller Mastodon had more pointed teeth, perfect for a diet of twigs and leaves. I was so excited about this behind the scenes segment of this episode because this is the coolest area right here. Tell me where we are. So this is what we call Project 23. Mm -hmm. It's our active excavation site. We actually excavate here 361 days a year. We're still pulling fossils out of the ground. Unbelievable. And why 23? What's so special about that number? So Project 23 is actually a big salvage excavation from when the art museum next door to us built a big underground parking structure about 12 years ago. And dig a giant hole next to one of the most productive fossil sites in the world, you might Surprise. expect to find some more fossils, <laughs> right? So what they found was actually 16 new, never before seen tar pit deposits, each one full of tens, if not hundreds of thousands of bones and plant fossils. The company hired a landscaping company that's used to transplanting, say, large fruit trees. Mm. And what they did is exactly the same process they use with trees. They, they pedestaled around the tar pits, built walls around each of the tar pit deposits as they went down, cut in from underneath, built a floor, and then lifted those boxes with an intact tar pit inside up out of the ground. Oh my God. Brought so them over to our side of the fence. And so each, uh, the largest one of these weighed about 123,000 pounds. I'm wondering if it's this one. This is a huge one. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, is, well, really this, isn't even, this isn't even the biggest one. Really? Yeah. But um, because they did that, we're able to actually excavate these deposits exactly as we would any other fossil deposit and take all of the same data. So we still excavate in a grid system. We take the really precise three-dimensional measurements on all of the larger bones, and we collect all of the dirt from around those bones that are so important for uh, understanding what the ecosystem looked like over the last several tens of thousands of years here in LA. Well, I'd love to see what it looks like inside, because I know this is the preliminary step to actually going into the fossil lab. So can we take a look at that? Absolutely, let's go look in a tar pit. Okay, so which crate are we looking at here, Emily? So this is uh, deposit 13 from Project 23, and this has been one of the most incredibly rich deposits. You can just see the jumble know, of fossils loaded. that are in here. Uh, we've got everything you know, from really big fossils. This is the upper arm, upper arm bone of a giant ground sloth. Mm. We've got the uh, same bone of a saber-toothed cat over there. We've got a bunch of bird bones. We've got ribs. We've got sticks all tangled up. And then among it, we have these sediments, these little gravel, pebbly areas, mm -hmm. and among those, when we wash the asphalt out of, that's where we're gonna find what we call the microfossils, so the seeds and the leaf fragments, okay. the insect bits, and the lizard jaws and mouse teeth, and all of these really cool, amazing tiny fossils that tell us so much about what the environment was like here in LA 
over the past time and how that environment changed mm -hmm. and the species in it moved and changed in response to environmental changes over the last 50,000 years. Well, I'm noticing strings here. I don't know what these are for, but I, I want to know what those are for. And I also want to know, how do you go about attacking this? So the strings here, this, these are grid lines, and these are one meter by one meter squares that we set up. And these allow us to take really precise three-dimensional measurements on every fossil that we excavate. <sighs> And that way, when we're going and asking questions about how did this particular deposit form, where were different fossils in relation to one another, we have all that information at our fingertips and we can basically reconstruct the fossil deposit bone by bone. Ay, ay, ay. And what, what kind of tools are you using to pull it apart? You know, the main tool that we use in a deposit as dense as, as, dense as this is actually dental picks. We actually get used dental picks yeah. donated from local dentist offices. That's a great idea. And yeah. we use not um, the sharp pointy edge because we don't want to scratch the bones, but the back curvy edge. And we use that to very gently sort of grain by grain scrape away the sediments to reveal the bones underneath. And then tweezer it out into some type of... Yeah, and then once we've got all of the sediment uh, removed from around a fossil, we put it in a bag with all its information, and then it goes into the fossil lab, and they take it from there. Well, I'm dying to see that, too. So thanks so much. This is incredible. Paleontologists discovered and started excavating Pit 91 in 1915, over 100 years ago. It was the 91st hole dug by early paleontologists. The deposit was so rich in fossils that they still dig here every summer. Digging at Pit 91 nearly doubled the number of species known from the tar pits. You can watch real paleontologists excavate real fossils from the gloopy black asphalt and learn how scientists use these specimens to study what Los Angeles was like 25,000 years ago during the Ice Age. This is one of our most exciting finds from Project 23. It's Zed, our Colombian mammoth skull. It's still in the field jacket, positioned upside down. These are where his tusks would have come out. These are his two upper teeth, his cheekbones, and the base of his skull where it connected to his neck. This 40,000-year-old incisor tooth, or tusk, belongs to Zed, the most complete Colombian mammoth ever excavated at the La Brea tar pits. A 40,000-year-old tooth is pretty fragile. When Zed was removed from the ground, his tusk and other fossilized remains were encased in protective plaster and foam jackets like this one. These jackets were then transported to the fossil lab where they were opened so they could be cleaned and studied. So this is a skull of another animal. Oh uh, this is the American lion. So a lion? along with the cave lions in Europe, these are the biggest cats that have ever lived. They were um, quite enormous. Yeah, look and, at the teeth. Yes, and, and highly carnivorous. So these were yeah. animals that you definitely would have wanted to stay away from back in the past. Yeah, and how many of these do you have? I, I see shelves and shelves of this. Yeah, so we found probably, you know, in the nature of dozens if not hundreds of American lions, but nothing compared with our most famous animal, the saber-toothed cats.
We've seen a lot of museums together, right? But this complex is amazing. To think that the unearthed remains of plants, insects, and animals from the last 50,000 years could be so relevant today, it's mind-boggling. The La Brea Tar Pits continues to provide a gateway to the Ice Age and help us understand the world around us. Thanks for joining us on Museum Access, where every visit is an adventure. I'm Leslie Mueller. See you next time. Made possible by TFI Envision, the connection to conversion agency. Palomino Restaurant Group, 25 years of creative cuisine. ML Capital Partners, building the businesses of tomorrow today.